Hi guys, it's Grant, a senior here at CC Teams, here with your Genesis 16 through 24 recap. There's a lot to cover, but first a little bit about me. I love movies. Who remembers when there was a time, about 100 years ago or so I think, where you could do this thing called <gasps> go to a theater and see a movie. It's insane, I know, I know. So. Specifically, I love Star Wars, and I'm really looking forward to catching up on The Mandalorian, which just ended the season two, so I'm really excited to catch up on that when I get a chance, so please no spoilers for anyone. But I'm willing to wager that none of you know what the actual Jedi Code says, so I'm gonna quote a little bit of it here. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. And that connects to what we're talking about today. We're continuing in the book of Genesis, which much like as the Old Testament as a whole, is most importantly about the self-revelation of God. Basically, how he tells us more about himself so that we might come to know him. Despite being written by Moses during the Exodus when the Ten Commandments were given, good works are not in the intended purpose of the Old Testament, but rather good works are a result of coming to know God better and hearing his story. This brings us to the core concept of Genesis and the entire Old Testament, the covenant, or the agreement between God and man, with the word testament literally meaning covenant. Through it, God reveals his nature to us, and it also sets a course of action for himself, provided humans are obedient to the terms of the covenant. Now, to catch up from where we were last week. Abram was a pagan, ordinary man, not any more righteous than those around him. Then, completely out of the blue one day, God said, leave your family, your descendants, everything you love in your native land, and go to the land where I will show you. Sounds great. But really, God's electing of Abraham's family to be his chosen people evidences grace. Not choosing Abraham because he was better than everyone else. It should be noted that the covenant established here, the details of which we'll discuss in our first highlight, must be ratified by human obedience. As Pastor Sanger said, God can use anything but nothing. If Abram wasn't faithful to the covenant, salvation history is over, dead, and humanity is doomed to eternal destruction in hell. That's great. But because Abraham heeded the call, salvation history was on track as the eventual birth of Jesus will come from a descendant of Abraham. The more we hear the pings of God, the more he will reveal to us. The next chapters that we will examine in our overview will now talk about the continual suspense of how God's promise will or will not be fulfilled. And there's this looming question of will God keep his covenant? Chapter 16, Ishmael is born. So then there's a question, does this mean Ishmael's gonna be the heir rather than the Abraham's wife's son uh, as God promised? Chapter 6, 17, um, it talks about the Abrahamic covenant, which we'll go over later. Chapter 18, Abraham's wife, Sarah, is promised his son. Chapter 19, Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed, raising the question of if Abraham's nephew Lot will become the heir rather than the supposed son of Sarah that's supposed to be on the way. Chapter 20, King Abimelech takes Sarah into his harem. Does this mean Abraham won't be able to have a child with his wife? In these instances, however, God remained faithful to his covenant promise, just as Abraham remained faithful to God. In chapter one, Isaac, the promised son and heir, is finally born. In chapter 22, Abraham's faith is tested with Isaac. In chapter 23, Sarah is buried. And in chapter 24, a wife for Isaac is found. Highlight one, the Abrahamic covenant. This is from chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. As a quick refresher, the covenant is a core concept in Genesis and the entire Old Testament, which literally means Old Covenant. Therefore, the Old Testament is not a history of Israel, but rather the history of the covenant. In his province with Abraham, God promises three things. Number one, he will have innumerable descendants who will become a great nation, the nation of Israel specifically. That's why Abraham's name changes to Abraham, or I should say Abram's name changes to Abraham, which translates to the father of many. Promise number two, the nation will possess the land of Canaan as an eternal possession. And finally, number three, all the nations of the world will be blessed through Abram's descendants, foreshadowing the verse, or the birth of Jesus Christ from his lineage. Nowhere is it stated anywhere in this covenant that it will be canceled due to human disobedience, despite the benefits definitely being lost from periods of time due to Israel's disobedience, particularly losing the land of Canaan. 
Nevertheless, the Abrahamic covenant is less about human obedience than it is about God's grace and faithfulness despite human sinfulness. With that being said, Abraham had to follow God's instructions in order to leave his land and relatives in order to ratify the covenant. In the same way, good works do not save us as Christians, but they do ratify or evidence the transformative power of the Holy Spirit within us. Therefore, the application is this. Allow your faith in Jesus Christ to dictate your actions. Highlight number two, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is from chapter 19, verses 16 through 17, as well as verse 26. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Angels appear before Abraham and reveal God's plan of destruction for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham intercedes saying, God, if just 50 people are righteous, will you spare them? God said yes. And then Abraham's like, mm, maybe that's too many. How about 40, 30, 20, maybe even 10? Yet, even then, there is not even 10 people who are righteous in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is unable to halt their destruction. Nevertheless, God has mercy on Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his family. And angels are literally seizing them and dragging them out of the city because of their initial hesitance to come with them. Theologically, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah highlights God's justice. The land and its cities were plentiful and fertile. God and Ishua showed kindness to the cities through these things, despite their extreme sinfulness. Nevertheless, their continued wicked behavior justified fire and sulfur raining from the heavens, a poetic justice of burning the plentiful crops that they held so dear. In the same way, God initially showed kindness to Lot's wife through orchestrating her escape, literally saying, go this way and you will be safe and don't look back. However, she had to look back at the burning city with a covetous heart, thus justifying her being turned into a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt! What's the application of all this? We must believe in Christ's salvation to save us from destruction. For those who do not heed the warning will be overtaken by judgment. I also want to emphasize God never wants to punish us. That's not who he is. He's a loving and merciful God. However, by choosing to reject him, he, his judgment must come upon us because that is part of his very nature. Also, we must not allow worldly things to corrupt our faith as the material desires of Lot's wife compelled her to look back. And as a final note, how great the mercy of God that he forgives us of our selfish material desires when all Lot's wife had to do was look back, not even give in to those desires, just look back and was transformed into a pillar of salt, a symbolic warning for us as Christians. Highlight number three, Abraham's faith is tested with Isaac. This comes from chapter 22, verses 12. This is the most important story in the entire book of Genesis, at least for me, and directly foreshadows the coming sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Up until now, the surmounted obstacles preventing the fulfillment of the covenant and the progression of salvation history have been circumstantial. But now the challenge comes directly from deity. God commands Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac, through whom the Abrahamic covenant is supposed to be fulfilled through. This creates a paradox. If Abraham refuses to sacrifice his son, he's no longer faithful to the covenant. However, if he chooses to obey God and sacrifice Isaac, God is no longer faithful to the covenant. So then the question becomes, how will this be resolved? As Abraham clutches the knife, his son tied up and laid on the altar, he helped to build the wood already laid for burning. Abraham's about to sacrifice his son's life, to take his son's life. And then an angel appears literally out of nowhere to stop him. In previous instances, Abraham was the prophet from obeying the callings of God. And it's a lot easier to obey when one is the prophet. Abraham was not this poor man in the middle of the wilderness. No, he was loaded. He's got these huge flocks of animals, which are basically the currency of the day. Even so, this particular instance is different. Abraham had literally nothing to gain through sacrificing his son, and he had everything to lose. Salvation history, though, was back on line. A ram was provided by God for the sacrifice, and that emphasis, again, falls on Abraham's fear or reverence for God. Salvation, generations upon generations later, right? Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for the sins of humanity, just as God provided that ram as a substitute for Isaac. The sons of man were and are 
being saved through the sacrifice of God's only Son. The application to all of this, fear the Lord even when you have nothing to gain for yourself. Just as Abraham had nothing to gain in preparing to kill Isaac, and Jesus had nothing to gain through forfeiting his holy life. Thank you guys for joining me along on this journey through Genesis 16 through 24. Challenge yourself to read along with us each day. It's only about 10 minutes. I hope you all have a great week as we remember tomorrow the great civil rights activist, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.